Welcome to the second episode of my leadership series. And today we have with us another iconic leader from the marketing and brand world. He has recently been added to the, he has recently been awarded the title of one of the most outstanding uh, leaders in Asia by the prestigious Asia Corporate Excellence Sustainability Awards, which is also known as ACES. He started his career in 91 with Unilever Pakistan in brand management. In 2001, he joined PepsiCo Pakistan as the marketing director for West Asia business and also the franchise director for Afghanistan. As the managing director of Pepsi, uh, he returned, um, he turned around the RTD business completely. And not only that, he, I would say, was the man behind making Pepsi synonymous to cricket and music in Pakistan. In 2006, he joined FNN Coca-Cola Malaysia as the general manager of sales and marketing. And within two years, he was promoted as the head of commercials and operations for Singapore, Malaysia, and Brunei. Uh, he then returned to Pakistan in 2010, where he served the roles of vice president and general manager ICI ExxonMobil, and later as the country man general manager for Nokia. Uh, therefore, he was again called back by FNN Beverage group Malaysia to join them as managing director. He is currently the CEO of Ethica Holdings Malaysia, a subsidy of Asahi Group, and leading three markets in his remit, which is Singapore, Malaysia, and Brunei. And it's an absolute pleasure to have him on my show today. Uh, so let me welcome Mr. Khalid Alvi. Hello, sir. How are you? Thank you, Fahad. Thank you. So humble to hear your introduction, and it's so good to see you after a long time. Likewise, sir. And I would like to share with the audience the fact that I had the privilege of working with Mr. Khalid Alvi directly at his media agency. And, and that too in a very early career phase. Uh, and that was, I would say, my learnings went skyrocketing at that time because I had worked with him some very exciting bands like Pepsi, Mountain Dew, and 7up. So it was a great experience. So Khalid, uh, thank you very much for taking time out on a weekend. I know it's a Sunday and I'll try to keep it very, very concise because uh, I won't take too much of time. There's a lot to learn from you. Uh, and as I had explained that we have structured the show in a manner that people who are starters can learn something from you, people who are in the middle management. And there are a few questions that generally people have, but generally you don't find people around you to answer them, even in the leadership. And sometimes it's that they don't ask. And sometimes it's just that they feel that who should they ask these questions to. So, to start with, for starters, uh, Khaled, what do you think that any starter fresh out of college should look for when they start applying for a job, that which company they should ideally go for? Is it just the names or uh, what are the elements that one should consider when joining a new company? An interesting question. And, and you know, it's it's changing, for Fahad. Um, the criteria when I got out of school and started my career was very different to what I'm seeing now. And to when I go back one generation before me, the criteria was very different. So this is this is how the world is, in my view, changed, right? My my parents' generation had a motivation and was driven mainly out of survival. Because at that point in time, I think they were all about getting their basics right. And they spent their entire livelihood towards survival. Hence, what they were looking for was stability, job security, certainty of being on a job and therefore you would know that generation spent 30 years 40 years with one organization retired from there and you know did fantastically well in surviving and giving us which is our generation uh, not the need to worry about survival and i think what we started working towards was standard of living so we started we started taking what our parents left us with and we started improving our standard of living and that is what my generation was driven out of. And therefore, the choice of organizations were also focused towards not necessarily job security, but was focused towards how do we actually grow in organizations to get better rewards, make a bigger difference, and start improving our lives and our, and our families' lives. And I think that's what that generation went through. Now, the current generation, um, who are the youngsters now who we are talking about, um, I don't think they've got to worry about survival drivers. I don't yeah. also think it's about a lot of standard of living. I think it's a lot of quality of life. So my my recommendation would be to the youngsters are a few things. I, I think this whole corporate company careers are going to are going to start becoming blur. 
So 20, 30 years ago, joining a PNG or a Unilever was one of those prestigious entry points for people's careers. I think, I think that's diluting. And what is coming in play is where does a youngster feel comfortable to walk into would have the following criteria in my view. And I think, and I would recommend also that one is you got to really look for your manager and your boss. You got to be very sure who you're working for. Um, and yes, organizations are very important, critical because they bring in a lot of systems. They teach a lot to you. But I, I think we should never underplay who we're going to work for and, and, and who is going to be our boss. I think that's going to be one strong criteria. Second is, are there organizations that's tying you down with their systems and processes? Or secondly, um, uh, you know, adversely giving you the opportunity to make a difference and make, uh, make um, um, influence the way things are done. Um, I think that to me is, is clearly the second criteria that people should look for. I, I don't think today youngsters are looking at a 20, 30 year career in organizations. And I think organizations also know that. They're also not expecting you to come and stick with them for 30 years, 40 years, as 20 years, as many of us, you know, did spend long time. Yeah. So yeah. I think boss environment that gives you the flexibility to influence the systems and processes. And thirdly, um, you got to do what you're passionate to do. It's not about just getting a job. Um, you know, if you're really passionate about finance, just get into finance and get into that critical experience. So the third thing really is that you make sure that your whole roadmap that you're planning out, chartering out for yourself, has got clear milestones on what critical experiences you need to attain and get in order for you to achieve your goals. So right. with these three things, I think that whole that whole um, concept of joining an MNC, joining a certain blue chip, is starting to get diluted and faded. And even organizations are not looking at employees for that longer term sustainability with them. Having said that, I'm sure all organizations would like people to stick with them because they invest a lot of money, time, resources with them. So that's three. And the last one is, uh, remember at the end of the day, you're stepping into your into the, into the corporate world in the real world. And you may think you know a lot, but there's a lot more that you need to learn. So do look at that lens of what are those environments which is going to give you the learning experience of the field and critical experience that you're looking for versus just joining a company. I've seen people fail um, joining some great MNCs because they didn't have these three things connected well. And I've seen some people succeed amazingly well without joining the MNCs. So, yeah. so it's a bit of a balance. So I think the world is changing um, and the youngsters should really follow your the boss environment that gives you the flexibility uh, and then and then make sure that you get the critical experiences that you need. I think that's going to be the key to me. Perfect. Thank you. And so, Khalid, what are the key priorities, two or three priorities of your first job when you join a company, whichever company it is, for youngsters, what should they focus on to begin with in the early stages of career? So, okay, great. Fast forward, you've entered the environment that you want to enter. You entered the company yeah. that you really wanted to enter. So the first thing is that... Uh, make sure that you've put in a lot of hard work. There is, there is no substitute um, available for the hard work that you'll put in in the early part of your career because it's learning the ropes, it's learning the tricks of the business. So hard work is something that you've got to be ready with. And when I say hard work, you're not looking at the time clock of nine to five in order to, 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 to finish your day's job. You're working pretty much 24 seven at all points in time. You've got to be very dedicated and, and putting in your hard work that you need. Second is, and this again varies from environments to environment. I do believe that values and, and sticking to values, uh, which are basic values, practical creativity, um, integrity, um, interpersonal skills, um, uh, problem solution. Um, your competencies and your values need to be the core focus of what you do. Um, don't deviate from it because it's very easy to deviate from it, easy to find shortcuts to it. So stick to the values and main competence that you have. Um, and, and the last thing which, you know, I'm starting to forgive a lot of focus on is communication. I feel that a lot of people have amazing set of abilities and they're fantastic in thinking, but their ability to articulate, their ability to communicate, their ability to influence 
I think has a huge opportunity to improve. So at the very early part of your career, understand the dynamics of message management, understand the, man the dynamics of, of how to communicate with multiple stakeholders, how do you communicate with the CEO of the organization and how do you can communicate with the driver of the same organization? And I think that whole communication piece, is, I just can't uh, overemphasize it because it is so important. Uh, so hard work, sticking to values and start focusing a lot on your communication. And communication is everything. It's, it's your presentation, it's your ability to have a small conversation, it's your ability to participate in organize, in conversations, it's your ability to write a good memo. I think that communication is something that we've got to really focus on. So if youngsters who feel that that's an area where they're either shy, they're not confident on speaking, they don't know what to say, they rather stay quiet. If you fall into that bracket, I would encourage you to go into programs, training programs, go talk to mentors. That helps you to overcome that because this is one thing that will help you succeed throughout your life. Right. So, how do you define a good culture in a company? Because as you said, I mean, uh, people have questions. Sometimes there are cultures which are not very open for juniors to speak up and the seniors might not like it that much. And there are cultures which are quite strict in point of view that there are a few things that only seniors are allowed to communicate to the next level or communicate to the other teams. So uh, how how can you handle those? So what's an ideal culture should be like? Okay, so you got two questions there. The first is, what's an ideal culture and what's a good culture, right? So I'll come to that okay. later. But uh, the first, the second part of the question, which is how do you manage in cultures and environment that may not be very conducive for participation, may not be conducive for open communication, may be more conducive for you to, uh, to say yes, rather than you know, sharing your own point of view. So remember, uh, culture is not a written policy anywhere in any organization, anywhere in the world. Culture is all about people. It's all about what kind of uh, way you would want to run the organization. Many times it's top down, most of the times it's top down. So the first thing you got to really do is as you walk in, you got to understand the sensitivity of the culture. You got to understand what this organization is all about. And when I said communication and why it's important, I think that's the important part of communication because you can't have a one standard way of communication and speak in exactly the same way across multiple cultures. And I'll give you a very clear example of it. You go to an American organization by and large, and I'm going 30,000 feet, I'm not being specific you would find an American organization a lot more vocal, a lot more communicative, a lot more, um, I would say, participative, my experience, right? And you will have yeah. American organizations who don't. When you would go into Japanese organizations, you will find communication is extremely to the content. It's, it's extremely, um, it's a culture which, which is defined by uh, the way Japanese Kaizen management theory is. When you go to a place like Saudi Arabia, and I'm talking about pure Saudi companies, you'll find a very different culture where, where, um, where your message management could be read rightly or wrongly. So, and I don't want to comment more on it. There's a, I'm sure you know what, what I'm talking about. I think the ability for you to understand what culture you're in is the first one before even you think about what you need to say, right? So you've got to really understand what culture you're in. Within that culture, you've got to really stand out in communicating within that culture. So if you've got a, uh, if you've got closed door culture where your next level doesn't give you access to the level ahead, it's fine. That's the way the culture is. Um, I think with the level that you have access to, you've got to make sure you have very strong, effective communication. You know, technically, if you look at two things, if youngsters and and managers can actually follow these two things, it will all fall in place. One, your boss and the culture and, and the level that you have access to trusts you, trusts you as a person, trusts you as a professional. And second is he's reliant on you. That level is reliant because you are adding value to the organization. These are the two things that's important that allows you the ability to communicate effectively. So. So to answer your question, uh, the second question, which is, you know, what do you do in limited cultures? I think one is first understand them. And then secondly, once you've understood them within its limitations, you've got to make sure your communication is effective, influencing enough, and is able to make a difference to the organization. 
what's an ideal culture i think in philosophical terms when i get into the car in the morning at 8:30 to go to the office and i can't wait to get to the office that tells me that it's a culture that i want to be in it's home away from home it's a place where i've got friends it's a place where i'm engaged it's a place where which has given an environment to me which allows me to deliver my 110% and if my leaders can allow me to do that i think the you know we we've, we've, we've met what we wanted to meet so that that's my my definition of it that actually an amazing answer for me also because that that's a very very different and interesting answer thank you for that so uh, i like from a point of view of competitive cultures how do good leaders deal with poor performance generally i mean there could be several reasons for poor performance actually we can't generalize that it could be market not responsive even good leaders can fail sometimes there could be personal problems there could be a lot of other things that play its role so how do you as a leader deal and since you are the ceo you must be dealing with so many other leaders as leaders of leaders how do you deal with poor performance so it's a very big subject that you're opening but yeah. let me try to give a precise answer to this um the way the corporate structure is built um i think a lot of organizations can potentially be a lot bigger if only their internal system processes and people were affected which basically means that a lot of organizations have performances which are not to par and it's got poor performance so it's not one organization or two um you know i'll give you quotations like big mnc's say that look if we knew what we know we would be three times the size so internally in the organization there's a lot of data that's not been analyzed well there's a lot of people who are not delivering to the levels that's expected out of them so that's a reality that we all go through typically yeah. you would have a standard deviation curve um if i look at it at a 30000 feet level you'll probably find 10% of the employees who are on the other on the right side of the standard deviation curve and you'll find 10% who are on the on the left side of the standard deviation curve this is high performers this is low performers and then in the middle you'll have average performers that falls into 90 within 90 you break it up again further but let's talk about pure poor performance um lots of time um my experience has been that people don't perform well because of multiple reasons and one of those are the company has not provided them the right tools culture and also they are also not the right fit for the role i think that to me leads to a lot of uh, lot of uh, poor performance except for that yes there are wrong hires the company has picked up there are there are people because of personal issues have let down their performance and they're not giving in the energy that's needed for the organization um and there are a few other reasons if it's organization weakness i don't think the individual needs to suffer and and the individual has got to pick up their socks and put this person in the right box if they've not put them in the right box give him the environment that's needed and and that's what leaders are supposed to do for people who are wrong fits and they've been wrong hires and people who've been declining their performance on a sustainable basis i don't think there's too much room for them to be sustained in the organization um uh, as a leader um you have to know that you will get high performers average performers and low performers the high performers are people you want to retain um and you want to continue to invest in them and you want to continue to make sure that they that they are delivering the average performers are a bulk of the organization uh, you want to continue the journey of improving them and improving their performances um and that is continuous the low performers is because of some reason if that reason has got to do with the organization i think the organization has got to change and it's got to make sure that it puts in the right framework needed for this individual however if it's for other reasons i don't think organizations should sustain poor performance beyond a certain point in time obviously there are legal limitations there are timelines involved in this and there's a whole process on how you would take them out yeah. but i don't think there is going to be acceptable tolerance tolerance so there will be tolerance um for pro performance on a sustainable basis in organizations um for reasons which are not the fault of the organization right so from your uh, conversation halit two questions have popped up in my mind first is in our organization where there is no structured career mapping 
even the high performers find it hard to assess what's their next step going to be. How do you handle that? Because in that case, either you are at the verge of losing people, and and since there is no structure, so what's a kind of a recommendation for such companies or people, especially who are stuck in such a situation? What what should they do? So look, um, you know, majority of the people are there to build careers. Majority of them are there to grow in organizations. Um, and majority of them want the organization to play a role in allowing them to grow. Um, so I'm, I'm completely empathetic towards it. And I think organizations need to have all their processes in place. I'm a believer in people. I have always been a believer of people. And if it wasn't for people below me and above me, I wouldn't be even half of who I am today. So organizations have a duty to, to make sure that the right critical experiences are being given and development is being done, put in place in growing them to more equipped managers, which will give them better and bigger responsibilities. And that then eventually gets translated into manager, senior manager, GM, director, CEO. So that's the, that's the worldly known names. But at the end, it's all about making an individual more capable, giving him the confidence, giving him the skills and critical experiences for him to build his capability to do a bigger job in the company. That's what it's really all about. If organizations don't have a proper structured process in doing it, they're at a weakness. They will lose people and they will not be able to reward them at the right time. It'll become extremely, um, it'll become extremely chaotic. It will become knee jerk and there your stability is at risk. On the other hand, I do think that compared to 20 or 30 years ago, where it was hugely dependent on the imp in the companies to build careers for people, I think a lot of power is now in the hands of people to build their careers. And if they don't proactively pursue in building their careers, irrespective of what processes are there in the organization, um, they, will, they will lose. I think in today's right. day and age, they will, they will lose. And therefore, if the current organization is not giving you the opportunity because they don't have a process to reward you correctly and to give you the right match job fix, you leave the organization. I don't think you should stay there. You should go into other environments which will allow you to be able to go to better and do better responsibility. So it's, it's twofold. Companies must. And secondly, I think the power is in a lot in the individual's hands now to build their careers. Right. Actually, you have somehow uh, answered my question that I was supposed to ask you about the stagnation in career. Sometimes it so happens that as you start climbing up, of course, there are limited slots available then, and there's only one top slot which is there. So sometimes when you reach there early, you could see that, no, you probably will have to serve the same position for another eight, 10 years because <laughs> it, it might take that long. In that case, of course, so what you are suggesting is either move out and search for better opportunity, or if the organization allows, you can try cross-functional departments or different markets. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Look, there's there's another there's another amazing book I read. It was on um, understanding yourself. His his and it's kind of researched across thousands of companies and thousands of employees. Typically, uh, if you look at the at a broad stroke level, you end up achieving and reaching a level one up or one down to your capability. Remember, these titles are worldly and these titles are only for society to recognize us. At the end of the day, these titles is a responsibility that's been uh, given to you to deliver for the organization. That responsibility, I have seen this myself. I've seen people peak one level up or one level lower than their capability to take those responsibilities. So in more right. cases than less, I have seen people stagnating because, not because of they couldn't get the levels, I think they've stagnated because their own um, competence building stopped. I right. think a lot of people stop learning and a lot of people don't end up going to their peak levels and they stop somewhere and they kind of, in a way, blame the environment, blame the companies. I tell you, I know of very few companies who don't need strong leaders, even in today's environment. While it's an employer's market, almost all organization needs very strong leaders between junior management, middle management, and senior management. And I've seen generally people, um, pe people get to their 
potentials one level up one level down and that potential is what you need to invest in continuing continuing to build so that's why you know i was kind of saying earlier join the right boss get an environment that gives you the flexibility to make an influence and thirdly get critical experiences it is right. so important for Sorry, Khalid. I think there was a slight discussion. Yes. Yeah, we'll continue. Something happened. I'm still connected on another another screen, over. Yeah, because uh, let me disconnect you from this one. Mm. There we go. Okay. So, um, so, 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 to me, I think stagnation. Um, guys, don't blame the organization for stagnation. Don't. Um, right. You got to invest in yourself. If you're strong, and if you're stronger than um, you feel the organization is using you, I assure you that there'll be other organizations that will need you and that will want you. I feel a lot of people stagnate, stagnate because um, they're not very sure of what career they're taking. They're not sure of the critical experiences they need to earn. I think communication is another aspect where I've seen some very capable people not able to go through a they, they hit a glass ceiling a bit earlier because they're not recognized. They, they're not seen as the ones who are influencing. Um, so I, I would put a lot of uh, responsibility on the individual for stagnation rather than the organization because organizations are many. And they feel you could continue to move uh, if you need to. So in a situation, like if there are three people competing for one top slot, communication is important, most important. People management skills are important. But assuming one of the candidates is like kind of an uh, introvert, right? And uh, while he's good, but amazing track record in the company, are we saying that his chances of going to the top, the top slot are lesser than the ones who are like really extroverts and who are amazing in their people no. skills? No, no, not at all. I, I, I don't think uh, introvertness or extrovertness is a personality type. You could be a fantastic communicator being an introvert. And you could be a fantastic communicator being an extrovert. You could be a useless communicator being an extrovert. And you could be a useless communicator being an introvert. So I don't think it's got anything to do with introvertness or or um, um, or extrovertness. Actually, what it has to do is is content. It's your body language. It's what you say. Uh, it's the message correctly managed. Uh, it's stakeholder management. It is staying focused to values. It is um, having, in my view, um, a control on your emotions. Um, that's a very, very important thing. I've seen a lot of people are unable to control their emotions well, and that kind of comes out in communication. So I completely disagree, Shah. I don't think introvert yeah. or extrovert has anything to do with it. But three people competing for one job and eventually one get it is unfortunately a reality because that job is one. Now, the reason why one of those two of those threes don't get it, there must be multiple reasons. I feel that eventually if you've done extensively hard work, if you've followed strong values, you're strong in communication, and obviously you, you need to have blessings from the almighty and prayers from your elders, eventually you don't lose out. You may lose yeah. out in a company not to be in that one person who became a CEO versus um, versus the other two who didn't. But, but if you're capable and you're strong, you will become a CEO. Maybe not in this organization, you'll become somewhere else or your own organization. So I think if you've worked hard, you've followed the right values, you're strong in communication, and you know, you've, you've, um, you've got your head at the right place, I, I think eventually you make it. You may not yeah. make it in that organization A, but, but you'll make it in organization B, or you could stick with the organization A and eventually get that slot. Uh, many organizations are not, they may have one slot in a particular country, but then they may have 20 other slots in other countries. I mean, you're, yeah. a, perfect, you're a perfect example of uh, success because you, know, you move, and I've kind of seen your career, you move from the organization, one organization to another, 
and then eventually leading to a point where you've established performance behind you. You've clearly established that you know the work very well and you will have people pulling you because eventually you have that competence that you've demonstrated to yourself to start with. And then because of communication, you've been able to effectively um, communicate that to people who matter, right? So, so I don't think that's going to be a barrier. Thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, one interesting thing, Khalid, there is right now these days a lot of conversations going around diversity and inclusion. And considering your experience, you have worked in so many markets. Uh, diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. Would you agree with that? I, I think as an organization, diversity and inclusion is going to become increasingly more and more important for you to succeed in the future. And I think having it as an option to me is not an option. Uh, organizations that in 20 years from today are going to excel and trust me, they will not be the same organizations which are excelling today. And they're going to be new organizations. If we go back 20 years, and if you look at the organizations that are excelling today, a lot of these organizations didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. They all came in now. Um, and if it wasn't for diversity and inclusion, um, I think they would not be to where they are now. And that will become increasingly more important going forward. It's it's no longer about, um, and, it, and it shouldn't be, it is no longer about the gender, it's no longer about the race, the ethnicity, the nationality. Uh, it is all about what organization brings on the table and delivers because every organization is is stretched. Every organization is stressed. Even the very successful ones are stressed because they're looking at a future which is going to be different. Um, and they're competing. In most cases, they have a competitor. And in most cases, they want to grow ahead of competitors. And in order for you to do that, there is no way you can run away from being an inclusive organization that allows participative thinking and picks up wisdom and knowledge and experience of the, the whole rather than one. And diversity, I'm a believer that everybody brings something to the table. So you got to be able to be very sure as a leader, what are the skills you are needing on the table? A lot of times we as leaders make that mistake. We may be wanting to hire a sales director. We may want to hire a marketing director. But actually what we're needing is Either do we need a very strong control person with demonstrated track record of demonstrating strong controls in the organization? Are we looking at aggressive top line builders um, who've demonstrated that? Um, are we looking at um, individuals who are all designed to build strategy for the future? So it's important for us to know exactly what are the skills we're needing and put that on the table. Uh, and I think that skills has no nationality, no color, no no what what you do need is experiences. So if I'm looking for a, a very traditional role in, let's say, China, in one of the rural China provinces where I need that individual to deal a lot with the local Chinese where English is not spoken, your English as a communication will become a important, your Chinese, a Mandarin, a uh, Hoyakin would need, become an important criteria for you to, to have because that job needs it. But that's got yeah. nothing to do with diversity and inclusion because that's just a very specific requirement for the job. Right. So, how is inclusion? Is inclusion or can inclusion be a little bit challenging for critical decisions when you are you are about to take some major decisions? And you know, okay. in our business, your decisions could be risky, quite risky, right? And can cost you a lot. So, is inclusion a barrier? I don't think so. Uh, look, the the one thing that I, I think we all need to probably take back with us, organizations are not a democracy. They, they are right. not a democracy, right? So if it was a democracy, all CEOs would be voted in. Um, no CEOs voted in, um, yeah. just voted in, maybe voted in by the board of directors. So it's not a democracy. What you do need is, uh, as a CEO, you can never be a subject matter expert in the entire organization. What you do need is, excellent leaders who know exactly what they need to do in their functions. Um, and to me, not taking their inputs um, and not making them as a part of participative decision process, uh, you are likely to lose out on that big opportunity that you may have. Absolutely, leaders are making critical decisions 
all the times and many times they're unpopular. I end up making a lot of unpopular decision and that, that's the risk I take on being on this job. And that's why the company has entrusted me on it. But no, I don't yeah. think it is a barrier. I think inclusion needs to be used as leveraging the collective wisdom of the organization to the best possible uh, options that are offered to the decision maker to make. Uh, as a CEO and as a leader, and this is a message to everybody who's listening here, if I can get people under me better than me in their respective fields, and if I could get them to just work together, I've done my job. Um, right. I have really done my job because, because that's really where the majority of the problems are. The issue is when you get very strong leaders and who are very good in their work, they're not easy to work with. They're, they're difficult to work with, you know, and because and yeah. they're running at very different pace to many other leaders. So, so if we could get leaders to be very good in what they do par excellence and get them to work together, I think as a CEO, they've done their, his job very well. Um, obviously, he needs to set the agenda. He needs to take people along. He's got to make sure that um, the they ex execution has happened to its core, right? So set the agenda, take people along and executing to excellence. But having said that, um, uh, if you can get strong leaders and they work together very well harmoniously, these three things will start falling in place faster and sooner. Right. So Harid, uh, as we're moving towards the closure of our discussion today, a leader who is very nice and considerate, but very self-centered versus a leader who is a difficult person to work with, very demanding, but selfless, which would be a better person or an option to work with? Okay, can you repeat your question again? A leader who is very nice and considerate from a personality point of view, very empathetic, but quite self-centered versus a boss who is very demanding, difficult to uh, work with, but at the same time, quite selfless, uh, an amazing person who would ideally, I mean, it's a personality choice again, but uh, what would you prefer for people who are listening today that what should be the choice of the person to work with? So there's no right or wrong answer for than this. And unfortunately, even people are very comfortable at times with just taking instructions from others in a very authoritative leadership style. And they're very comfortable because they don't want to put their neck on the line. Um, and then you'll get, get environments where um, you would want leaders to take some decisions because you want them to take decisions, but the leaders are undecided. So, so uh, you, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. My advice yeah. to my advice to everybody is get a leader who's got a big heart. Don't get a leader right. who is myopic, who's um, who's small thinker. And I have seen many leaders who are like like the small thinkers I'm talking about, and I think it'll never help you. Get a leader who's got a big heart. He will be demanding or not demanding as a separate issue, but you need somebody who's a human being who, who's who's got a real heart and a and, and a great heart, who's generous, who is uh, who rewards, who compliments, who appreciates, and will also come and criticize to you when things are not right. But get somebody who's generous. Get a leader who's got a big heart. Um, even if he's very demanding, and even if he's extremely painful because he's just getting you to work much more than you'd expected or you've been working, it's fine because yeah. he's training you to be a completely different, um, different leader altogether. But get somebody who's generous. If you if you're in a company who doesn't reward, if if you if you're working with a leader who doesn't reward you, who's careful in the increments he gives you, extra two three percent bothers him. Um, and he's not, you know, recognizing you at the right time, and it's kind of taking away effort. Just leave that company, leave that leader. You're wasting time because right. that leader is going to fall at some stage in their lives, right? So, so my advice to youngsters, my advice to even you know others who are not necessarily youngsters, get work with people who've got a big heart. Work with people who who are there to support you, who are there behind you all the way, um, and and watch what will what that will do is it will give you the impetus to deliver your 120%. And once you can do that, you know, sky's the limit. There's really no end to it from there on. Right. So, Khaled, last question for today. In your yeah. view, what is leadership? Hmm, that's a, that's a very broad question and a very important <laughs> question. Um, leaders are 
leaders are people who, in my view, have the following traits, right? One who can get a good sense of how future is going to look like. Right. Two, they're people who believe in that future. Three, they have a big heart and they lead a set of people who he believes in and ensures that every tool is provided to them to deliver. He's somebody who rolls up his sleeves and he is not level and hierarchy conscious. Um, He's somebody who can who's fair and he's very strong on values. Um, I can't think of a leader I can't trust, right? So so to me, it's someone who's a holder of custodian of values. Um, someone who will punish you or reward you fairly. And someone who takes people along. Right. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and it was, again, after a very long time for it, really nice talking to you and Likewise. people who people who are listening uh, my apologies because uh, i probably have a bad light because when the day started it was bright and sunny in sydney right okay. now it's cloudy and raining okay. so thank you very much for taking time out sir thank you and uh, i'll stay in touch with you and good thank to you see you for a very long time thank you for my best wishes to you in your career and best wishes to everybody who's listening to us thank you so much thank you thank you Thanks. bye-bye, bye-bye.